Good evening, everyone. Thanks for watching tonight's video. And as might, be, as might be expected, or as should be expected, Candy is pawing all over me. What do you want? What do you want? I'm like, can you see me? She doesn't actually want pets. What she wants is what's in my pocket. <laughs> all right. Shake paw. Shake paw. Shake paw. Lay down. Speak. Speak again. Come on, give me another one. Speak. Speak. Come on. Speak. There we go. She likes to chuff. She, oh, oh, oh. But she doesn't actually bark. Anyway, uh, thanks as always to everyone who has liked, uh, who has subscribed to my channel. I haven't said it for a while. A uh, big part of the reason why I do these videos, uh, Joe Nobody, Gordon Kazi out in southeastern Ontario, more or less just trying to inject my voice into the public discourse. And that's difficult in today's world. There's so much media out there. There's so much effort being expelled in trying to influence people's opinions and to steer them in one particular direction or another. And generally speaking, I tend to go against the, the prevailing currents. Uh, I tend to be a bit of a contrarian if, uh, if the media and the uh, overwhelming narrative says go right, I am naturally inclined to go left. And putting out videos as I do, uh, the YouTube game has been said by many before me. It's a, you know, it's a challenge. And to everyone who has uh, liked my videos and subscribed to the channel, it helps, as I understand it, defeat the algorithms, increase my visibility, helps me get my voice out there. One quick little note, if you hit the, the subscription bell, you actually have to open it up. I guess there are three dots or something beside it. And then it, what degree of subscription do you want? Do you want to be notified? So if you want to be notified that a live video is coming on, you need to have the, the bell has to be dark. And it turns black when you hit the subscribe to all. So if that, if you're inclined toward that, if you want to be notified when I am going live, then you need to, not just hit the bell, but also then make sure you click on the part that sa says all, and then you'll get notified every time I do a live, which typically I try to do on Wednesday nights, which is what tonight is. It's Wednesday, April 10th, just after 11.30 p.m. now. And um, the other night that I try to do these is Sundays, but I also do the mother nights of the week when things are on my mind, when I want to get things, when I want to put things out there. Um, what I wanted to talk about tonight was the significance of going to zero in somewhat. Uh, obviously, Israel is a big news item right now. But then when you focus in on Israel, the principal focus is on Jerusalem. A lot of the time because it's a, such a contentious city and then you then you zoom in even further and you get to the temple mount and this has to be the most contentious little piece of small little tiny piece of real estate when we talk about the global scale and wow uh and one last little generalistic point i realized that my channel does not have super high value production. You know, I'm, my the lighting is poor, the audio is, isn't the best, I don't have a microphone. But to be entirely honest, I kind of like it that way because I believe that it speaks to authenticity, to genuineness. It's not dressed up, it's not lipstick being put on a pig not the best metaphor perhaps, but I'll go with it. Uh, I find that 
Oh, when you watch so many other videos and it's not hard to make those production values. It's not so it's not difficult in today's world. The technology is easily accessible to dress things up and to make things pretty. But I think the, the most important thing is content. I'm going to read what Anna Monarchy, what he has to say. I don't I didn't get notified this time for whatever reason. Sometimes the notifications just don't go through. I was scrolling through the suggested video list. I don't know if you've clicked the all or not. And Monarchy shows up on most, and it's really genuinely everyone who shows up regularly. And Monarchy, um, YouTube, um, Sheriff of YouTube is another one. Um, Joseph, uh, there's a few, and I'm going to forget names, so I'm going to stop there. I've got Johnny Appleseed, another. Uh, <laughs> who talks about my sweet now. She's hardly a puppy anymore. We got her in 2020. But what, uh, just getting back to what I wanted to talk about tonight, is what is so incredibly significant about Israel in general, Jerusalem more specifically, and then even more specifically, the Temple Mount. And I approached things from the perspective of a, a Christian. That's the lens worldview that I look through. Uh, and that gives me insight that I think sometimes doesn't exist in the broader culture. I was I work work with a guy who asked asked me, did you know, he said, did you know that the Arabs and the you know the Muslims and the Jews are connected? And I said, yeah, through Abraham. Abraham had two kids, one by Hagar and one by uh, uh, his wife, Sarah. And Ishmael became the basic, the basic, basically the father of the Arabians or the uh, Islamic world. And Isaac became the father of, you know, that's where the two diverge. And he was like, oh, you know this. I, I only just learned this. And it's because biblical uh, learning has, it's been pushed aside over the last, oh, 40, 50 years. And now it's so far on the edge that just people basically ignore it. And then we see a conflict like this going on, what's going on in Israel between the Palestinians and the Israelis, between Hamas, the Houthis and Hezbollah and the IDF and People don't understand the root, how deep things go. I'm going to read what Anna Monarchy have said, is saying. Plenty of videos these days have all or mostly AI graphics. Some of the simple cartoon videos like the Infographics channel get boring. Also with the AI videos lacking, lacking human expression. I try to avoid as much of the AI as I can, but I found out uh, recently that I, I got sucked in. Uh, by a guy, uh, a gospel singer from Kenya, whose name I forget, but uh, he put out a video that made it look like he was on America's Got Talent. And he, and, and being a Christian, it, I, I loved the music he was singing. I don't think he was actually singing it. I, was th I think he was lip syncing it. And he basically... I had nephews of, of mine point this out to me that I, I went to show them and they said, oh, that this guy's just, it's a fake. Went, really? And then once I looked at it critically, it was obvious, and I, but I got taken in. And it's easy to get taken in into, to, into, the, in today's world. Muck Duck Farmer says, yes, AI is everywhere. Uh, and uh, you learn to see the fakeness. I have to increase my level of scrutiny not to be taken in. Uh, typically what I do when it comes to the news and when it comes to social media type posting and I, 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 any images, any videos I see, I'm automatically skeptical. Someone will show me a picture and say, this is what Gaza looks like. And I'll say, okay, could be Yemen, could be somewhere else in the Middle East. It could be Baghdad. Uh, during the Iraq, uh, uh, the, the, the Iraq war, one of the Persian Gulf Wars, who knows? But people like, you know, images, 
people are more prone to look at an image and a short little meme type posting. And it's a great way to sway public opinion one way or another. But what is so significant about Israel? What is so significant about Jerusalem? And, and obviously now the Temple Mount. And there are some things I, I, I think are not widely known. Firstly, the Dome of the Rock, that's the silver or silver, gold, brass, whatever color you want to call it. I think it's a, best described as a golden color, that dome that sits on the Temple Mount. That is, the reason it is called the Dome of the Rock is that at the center of it, when you go inside, which I don't think a non-Muslim is allowed to go inside, but there are pictures out there you can see, and there is a rock in the middle of that interior in the interior of that structure and it is on that rock that it is believed or it is held that abraham went to sacrifice his son isaac on that this was the site of the uh, uh, uh it's recounted in genesis how god instructed Abraham to take his only son by by Sarah. He had another son with a slave woman by the name of Hagar, but um, Isaac was the son of his wife, and it was through Isaac that the covenant promises were, that they were supposed to be fulfilled, and to take his son and to bind him and to sacrifice him and I think I, I may have this wrong, but I think it's Mount Moriah where, and this is the rock under the dome of the rock structure on the Temple Mount where it's contended. And this structure, this Islamic dome exists. And so it is significant to Jews. It can be significant to Christians and it's also significant to Muslims, I may be wrong on this, but I believe that Muslims, at least some Muslims, believe that rather than sacrificing Isaac, that uh, Abraham was sacrificing Ishmael. Ishmael would have been the firstborn. Isaac came after. Going to catch up with what is being said. Anna Monarchy says, some AI is getting difficult to differentiate from reality these days. Sometimes I don't know if a picture is real or not, and that's why I say when I see anything, even in the news, I uh, I question its validity, but it's and especially even more so on anything shared on YouTube or social media. Mud Duck Farmer says GPS satellites went dead for an hour. Scared me though it was my equipment, maybe a jammer or sunspots. Johnny Appleseed is asking, is this the mount that the Templars built upon? Okay, we're getting in now we're getting to the crusader period when and yes um it is the reason they're called the 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 knights templar templar refers to temple and after the crusaders had conquered the holy lands pilgrims were wanting to make pilgrimages to the Holy Lands, to Jerusalem, and to see the site of the cruci crucifixion, Nazareth's. They want to see the Sea of Galilee. So people were traveling on the roads. And the Knights Templar was given a uh, papal de decree establishing that order. And it was their job to protect um, pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land during their pilgrimage. And within Jerusalem itself, the Templars were, they, they, they stabled their horses and established some living arrangements, I guess, within the ruins of what had originally been Solomon's Temple, which later became Herod's Temple. And they, on the ruins of, of the structure, and then sometime later, the Templars became an incredibly powerful and incredibly wealthy 
order, the, probably the most wealthy order. You know, you have the Franciscans, you have the Jesuits, you have these different orders within the cat within the Roman Church. Well, the Templars were the supreme; they were the most wealthy, most powerful. And then it was sometime, I think, in the 1100s, maybe 1200. 1200s. It's where we get the superstition about Friday the 13th comes down. A papal decree went out accusing the Templar Knights of heresy, of spitting on the cross, and of all manner of sacrilegious acts and rites. And so on Friday the 13th of whatever year it was, 1100, 1200 something, in that in and around that area, uh, they were all rounded up. And it's at this point that history stops and then we move into myth and legend. And myth and legend can have basis in reality. Uh, it is said that the Templar Knights had the world's largest navy when they were stepped down on. And it is believed by many that uh, within that the ruins of the old Jewish temple that they had found something, either value, something valuable in terms of tangible value or some secret knowledge or some secret. This was the entire basis of the Da Vinci Code is that they had acquired secret knowledge about Jesus having not only survived the cross, um, but also then having been married to Mary Magdalene and that Mary Magdalene and Jesus had had at least one child together and you get this uh, cult of Sophia and it's contended that Jesus then died and that Mary Magdalene made her way up to France and that uh, this bloodline continues even to the present day. And that was the whole basis of the uh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. It was based on a book which had been called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. That was written by three authors. And they were taken in by a French gentleman. I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, oh, I can't I can't remember the, the individual's name. Plant Plantard, Plantard. P-L-A-N-T-A-R-D, Plantar, and Plantar had traced his own lineage back to the Mergovian dynasty, which gave us Dagobert and other kings of France, and he was able to somehow trace his family history, his lineage, his ancestry, back to Dagobert and this Mergovian, Morogidian, however you want to pronounce it, this ancestral line. And what he had done is he created a secret society called the Priori of Zion. Uh, and he had included in a list all, all types of significant individuals like Rene Descartes and Victor Hugo and others. However, it's widely believed to have been fabricated and that he basically left this list out in a library in Paris for this Michael Bajant and two other authors to find them so that they would investigate this and it would actually make him something of uh, the heir to the vac vac now vacant French throne because France uh, abandoned the monarchy during the French Revolution. And you get it's history can be fascinating. It can also be frustrating because myth and legend weave their way in, and it's at times it becomes difficult to separate the two. I got to catch up. <clears throat> so Johnny Appleseed, in answer to your question, yes, the Templar Knights <clears throat> at least stabled their horses in the ruins of the destroyed temple. And the temple originally was Solomon's temple. And then um, uh, later, it that temple, the temple that Solomon built was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then 
70 odd years later, the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem uh, by the Medo-Persian King Cyrus, this is where the book of Esther comes in. And then the temple, we had, I think it's Nehemiah and others started to rebuild the second temple. And then a hundred or so years before Christ, in and around Christ's time, but just before, King Herod refurbished, rededicated, and renovated the temple and brought it back to the glory that it had during Solomon's time, at least restored some of the glory luster to it. But then in AD 70, um, there was a, a Jewish revolt. The Jews revolted against Roman occupation, and it started in AD 66, and then finally the Jews were defeated, and the Romans utterly destroyed the temple again, and from AD 70 until 2024, now today, there has never been, for the last 2,000 odd years, there has not been a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, and that was, the temple was central to the, the religious life of the Jewish people, not just in Jerusalem, but certainly, you know, Jerusalem is the capital. And it has been said, and I've meant to say this many times in my videos, but it's something that always slips my mind. And that is that in the intervening years, after the temple was destroyed, after the diaspora, when, when the Jewish people were scattered to the four corners of the earth, that at some point during the Passover season, which is what we're approaching now, it was customary for Jews to say, next year in Jerusalem. Now, some have made the argument that that was a metaphorical, allegorical type representation next year in Jerusalem. They didn't mean it physically, but it was around the late 1800s that Zionism as a political movement and trying to reestablish a Jewish homeland in the Levant, in, in and around Jerusalem, in ancient Judea and Samaria, or what had become known as Palestine, that um, that idea took start started to steamroll, started to move forward, and then uh, and it finally came to fruition in I would say 1949. In in March of 1949, after a brutal war between the Jewish people living in the former British Mandate of Palestine, after a brutal from May of 1948 to March of 1949. Finally, peace was established. The new state of Israel signed peace agreements between themselves and the five nations that had invaded the former British mandated territory of Palestine. After those agreements were signed, Israel was recognized as a nation by the United Nations uh, in June of 1949. So for me, the birth of Israel, uh, they celebrate May 14th. 1948 as their birth. I would say it was June of 1949 or maybe March. Anyway, I'm going to catch up. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer says, wait so much dollars, so much money and resources for nothing. Johnny Appleseed, a bit of a stretch. I got to keep up quicker, quicker because I don't know now what some of these comments are referring to what is a bit of a stretch. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer, it's a good read, The Make Up Your Own Mind. I assume he's talking, uh, that Mud Duck Farmer is talking about The Da Vinci Code. I've read the book. I've read all of Dan Brown's books. Um, Mud Duck Farmer, research, it's a good story. I have researched it even before it came out. Even before Dan Brown wrote his book, The Da Vinci Code, I had already read Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And this was during my, this was before I came back to Christ. This is before I came back to the Christian faith. This is when I was, for lack of a better, better expression, when I was wandering in the wilderness before I came back. Um, and Johnny Appleseed says, plantar warts. I think the name is spelled plant, plantar with a D. 
plantard, but in French, you don't pronounce D's when they're at the end of, of a sent or at the end of a word. Uh, actually, it's one of the reasons I prefer going by Gordon to Gord. A lot of Canadians prefer Gord to Gordon. Uh, but if you live in Quebec, which I did, I spent, I was there from 2011 to 2015. And they can, it's French when they hit a D sound at the end of a word, they can't pronounce it. So I would say, you know, comment that pet too. What's your name? Uh, Gord. Gord, 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 Gordon. Ah, Gordon. They can say the D in the middle, but not at the end. You might know some French words like d'abord. Well, anyway, d'abord, to d'abord. But they, it's got a D at the end. You don't pronounce it. Pronounce it. I'm digressing. Uh, and a monarchy uh, has he's read Da Vinci Code and Angels and Demons. Thought they were decent books. They are. They're great thrillers. They're great. They're, they're very suspenseful. Uh, uh, and found them interesting. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer says books banded from Bible. Do you mean banned from the Bible? Uh, talking about maybe like Enoch or others, Gospel of Thomas, books that were deemed heretical. Uh, but at any rate, so when it comes to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where the, exists now the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock is situated over, and if you were able to go inside, you would see a rock where it is contended that Abraham went to sacrifice his son on. And the full story is that uh, then God, having seen Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his own son, that it was a test, and that then an angel of the Lord told Abraham not to touch his son, and a, um, a ram, a male sheep, was found with its horns caught in a thicket, and that, rather than Isaac, was used as the sacrifice. And religious commentators, Christian uh, pastors, priests, and such will often make the point that at no point was Isaac's life ever at risk because either A, Abraham was going to refuse to obey God's command, in which case Isaac isn't at risk, or secondly, Abraham does obey God's command, in which case God offers a substitutionary sacrifice in place of his son. So either way, Isaac was not going to be sacrificed. And there are a lot of pastors, priests, ministers who will sermonize on that point. Just going to catch up. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer says, will this rock end the world? World without end. No, I, I will tell you from a, from a perspective of faith that no, it will not end the world. But it could. Uh, it is believed by many that it will bring about the end of an age, the end of this age, that it is central to what is unfolding. Um, if Iran captures the rock, world end, question mark. Well, now let's get into it. Why now? So we, we see the, what, why the rock is significant, where the dome of the rock is built. We see why this is significant to Jews and to uh, Christians and to um, Muslims, because Abraham is, these are called the three Abrahamic faiths. These are the world into which Abraham was born. And it's reckoned that he lived over 4,000 years ago, like 20, that he was, that Abraham was born sometime 2100, 2200 BC. So for, for over 4,000 years ago, and into this world into which Abraham was born, the, it was a polytheistic world. There was a God, there was the sun God, the water God, the moon God, the God of the underworld. There were a, pan, a pantheon of gods. And Abraham introduced the concept of a supreme creator God, the Lord Most High. 
and that uh, everyone else in the world was worshiping images, idols, things made of stone, of wood, of metal, and uh, things that rust and decay and will come to nothing as opposed to the one eternal God. Um, Johnny Appleseed, right, monotheism. Abraham introduced, is the father of monotheism, of one God, one God as opposed to polytheism, many gods. And from Abraham, we get Isaac and Jacob. Jacob, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, and he becomes the patriarch of the Israelites, his name having been changed from Jacob to Israel. So all his 12 sons then form the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are the Israelites. And it is on this mountain, I mean, if we go through the history, Jacob and his sons eventually move into Egypt, into the land of Goshen, and eventually are enslaved. They're enslaved for about 400 years. And then they uh, Moses delivers them from bondage, from slavery in Egypt. They wander in the desert for 40 years in the wilderness. Um, and then after 40 years of wandering in the desert or the wilderness, Joshua then leads the people across the Jordan River. Uh, the kingdom of Israel is a unified kingdom. The 12 tribes each given a, a section of land and they go through a period of judges. But the people of Israel don't like being ruled by judges. They see everyone around them, the Egyptians, the Moabites, the Hittites, the, the Thisites, the Thatites, every, all the other peoples are ruled by a king. And so the Israelites are like, hey, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. And so they're given a king, King Saul. But Saul loses the favor of the Lord. And then through the prophet oh, Samuel, I believe it's Samuel, uh, David, King David, is designated as the new king. And then it is David who conquers the city of of Jerusalem, which I believe when he conquered it, it was inhabited, held by a group that were called the Jebusites, J-E-B-U-S-I-T-E-S, the Jebusites, and he built a, built a fortified walled city. And then it's David's son, Solomon, who is tasked with creating a temple, and it's built onto the Temple Mount. And that temple stands until in and around five in the 500s BC when Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar conquers the Israelites, the southern kingdom of Judah. I mean, there's so much history here. It's tough to touch on everything, but the, the kingdom of Israel was unified. And then after Solomon, it split into two. And there was a northern kingdom that retained the name Israel and comprised 10 tribes. And then the southern kingdom of Judah, which comprised two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And it was in the 700s BC when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Israel ceased to exist and they're referred to as the lost 10 tribes of Israel. And so all that is left of Israel is just a remnant, this, this tribe of Judah and, and uh, Benjamin. And the people living in the area then become known as uh, Judites or Judahites or Judeans. And it's from that that we get the term Jew. We, get, we like to make things easier. Um, and Monarchy says that Iran has been making nuclear and EMP threats, uh, electromagnetic pulse threats. I haven't heard about the EMP threats. I have heard about the nuclear. You know, their nuclear program is paramount 
to Iran. They have a number of nuclear sites. No one knows exactly how close they are to developing a nuclear weapon. Perhaps, you know, for all I know, they could already be there, but there's nothing official. Um, and Monarchy, they are also uh, uh, out to get America. Uh, you'll hear the rhetoric from Iran and uh, the United States is the big Satan. Israel is the little Satan. That's their worldview. Uh, the United States of America is the big Satan. Israel is the little Satan. Um, Johnny Appleseed is making reference to Solomon was regarded as one the wisest man who had ever lived. He made a prayer to God, a prayer that pleased God very much because rather than asking for w riches and wealth and power or anything, Solomon asked for wisdom and God, it is written, granted him wisdom. And then famously, uh, two women came before him and what had happened is one woman's child had died and the other woman had a child that lived. And while the woman was sleeping, the woman who had the child lived while she was sleeping, the woman whose child had died came and stole her child. And so there was a dispute as to who the mother of the child was. The two women were brought with the child before King Solomon to adjudicate whose child is this? And Solomon said, split the child in half and give half to each. And the woman who had stolen the child was happy with that scenario. But the woman who was the actual mother said, no, 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 let, let the child live. I don't want it, the child killed. And Solomon said, that's the true mother of the child. Seinfeld kind of made uh, light of it with an episode where it was uh, the point of contention was a bicycle and it was Kramer of all people cast into the role of being King Solomon and deciding between uh, Newman and uh, Elaine whose bike it actually was. Um, Mud, Mud Duck Farmer says everyone's still related in Europe fighting kids. Uh, they needed DNA testing back then, not split the child. Well, there was no DNA testing back uh, in Solomon's time. Uh, but at any rate, let's get forward to, um, so we get to AD 70 and, and the years following. And the, the Romans were fed up with uh, the Jewish people. They found them. Everything it says in the Bible about the Jewish people, the Romans found out about stick, stiff-necked, rebellious, always doing their own thing. And so the Romans had had it with them. So there was this mass diaspora. A lot of uh, Jews uh, made their way into the arid region of Samaria, what we would now call northern Israel, up around the Sea of Galilee, that area. They moved north from Jerusalem and, you know, settled in, in, in rural areas and laid low. Uh, but many more were sent into slavery in Italy. Uh, some went along the coast of North Africa and eventually into the Iberian Peninsula of Portugal and Spain. Uh, the two main groups that we see identified today are the Sephardic Jews, and they're the ones who went along the coast of North Africa and into the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and Portugal. There's, they're the Sephardic Jews, those that came uh, out of Israel and went uh, into slavery in a lot of cases in Italy, uh, and then eventually migrated into Europe. They became known as the Ashkenazi Jews. And um, it's actually, they've done genetic testing and found that just about all Ashkenazi Jews, that is to say European Jews, not um, Eastern European Jews, not Western European. The Western European Jews on the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, they, they tend to be darker skinned. Whereas the Euro, um, Eastern European Jews tend to be much 
more Caucasian in nature. And they find that just about all the Ashkenazi Jews, that there were four progenitors, four women, four Italian women. Just about every Ashkenazi Jew has one of these four Italian women as a common ancestor. So they did not remain. There was intermarriage. So, and when they do genetic testing, they find that among the Ashkenazi, that about they're about 15 to 20% of their DNA could be defined as Semitic or Middle Eastern DNA, and it's 80% European. And that's why the word Jew is so problematic because it's, you know, you, you, when someone is um, expressing hatred for Jews, you can't call it racism because uh, Jews can be black, white, and every color in between. It's not racial. Uh, and it's not even religious necessarily because not all, not all, not everyone, everyone, people who call themselves Jews, quite often they can be atheists. So it's not even religious. And so the best description I've heard is an ethno religious group. So when you talk about prejudice toward Jews, they came up with this term anti-Semitism. And it was actually someone who was anti-Semitic who coined the term anti-Semitism to say, I'm not racist. I'm anti-Semitic. <laughs> and by Semites, he was referring specifically to Jews, not to Arabs, um, uh, this gets so complicated. Um, um, Semitic is a language group. And in the, lang the Semitic languages include Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. So it's a language group. But the term anti-Semitic, when it was coined back in the 1800s, it was meant specifically to refer to people who were Jewish. So I'm going to catch up. Uh, mud duck farmer says it's called neighbors. Everyone has a right to be there. Pay your property taxes. Then if not like a big fence and don't talk to them, easy to fix problem. We all have it. Uh, Johnny Appleseed writes any that remain. I don't know what you mean. Any that remain. You'll have to help me out with that. Anyway. Uh, so, after the Jews are dispersed, by and large, a few remain, not many. At times, the, popu the Jewish population in this region got down to in around 10,000. But um, the Romans under Hadrian were totally fed up with the Jewish people. And so Hadrian actually reached back into J Jewish history and he wanted to stay, he wanted the name Israel erased from the record books. He wanted the name of Israel to be gone forever. And so this area, which had been known as either Judah or Judea, uh, he, he gave it a new name. And the new name he gave it was Palestina. And he called it that because that was the Latin rendering of the Philist land of the Philistines, Philistia. And he, so he called it Philistia. And the name stuck. The name stuck around right into the 20, 20th century. Uh, but eventually in English, Philistia got, was rendered into English as Palestine. So, but, uh, so after the diaspora and everything, now the Romans are ruling this area. But then the Roman Empire split in two. And uh, you had the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern, the Western Roman Empire, the capital, the main city is um, Rome. The Eastern Roman Empire become the capital is uh, Constantinople in Turkey. It's also called the Byzantine Empire. So, what we call Israel today was part of the Byzantine Empire, but then. In the 600s, the around 634 AD is what the uh, history books say. 634 AD, 
the Arabians moved into the Levant. Arabians come from the Arabian Peninsula, and that is Saudi Arabia today, Yemen, Bahrain, Qatar, all the Emirate states, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. That's the Arabian Peninsula. They came and they conquered the Levant, which is another name for this land of Israel, the Levantine coast. So they came in and they conquered it. And at this point, Islam is basically in its infancy. Uh, Muhammad had just died in six the history, the history books say Muhammad died in 632 AD. He actually didn't live to uh, see the conquest of Judea, or what the Romans had called Palestina. He wasn't alive for it. Um, he never actually set foot in Palestina. I'm going to catch up. Uh, Oh, okay. Johnny Appleseed talks about the fact that Europe, European Jewry were heavily euthanized. Those that were, that's what he meant, any that remain. There were uh, the Holocaust, it is reckoned that uh, six million Jews lost their lives uh, in, in the closing, in the last year or so of the Third Reich, um, Hitler's infamous final solution. And uh, it was actually the World Jewish Congress at that point had called on all displaced Jews to descend upon the land of Israel because Britain had in 1917 declared to the world that it was favorable towards creating a Jewish nation state in the biblical holy lands. But they hadn't, they hadn't uh, backed up their promise. They hadn't backed up their words with action. They left, uh, they, they, they were administering the territory, but they were not doing, they were, try, they were trying, I think it's safe to argue, they tried to establish a Jewish national homeland, but the Arab peoples living there, and, and in particular the, the Arab countries neighboring, were adamant that no Jewish nation state should ever be allowed to be created in the Holy Land, ever and they would not accept it. So what happens is um, now in 634 AD, now Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, is under Arab control, uh, and the Arabs have just become Islamic or Muslim. And there's a verse in the Quran about a nighttime journey where Muhammad traveled from the nearest mosque to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa is Arabic and it means furthest or most ex extreme, depending on how you want to translate the word. It's often translated as from the nearest to the furthest mosque, from the nearest mosque to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to the mosque furthest away. And uh, so some years after Muhammad has already died and um, after the Arabs have now conquered Jerusalem, they built a mosque on the Temple Mount. And the name they gave it was, they called it, this is the furthest mosque, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. They gave it the name from the Quran. And so... It is widely believed now by Muslims that this is the mosque to which uh, Muhammad made his mythical nighttime journey, uh, where he was taken from the nearest mosque to the Al-Aqsa, furthest mosque, and then was taken up into heaven and taught how Muslims are to pray. And... Uh, the obviously, if that happened, that meant that Muhammad traveled through not just space, but through time. He went forward in time because the Al-Aqsa Mosque wasn't built yet when he was alive. Um, 
what has been suggested to me, and I think it's a plausible explanation, is that Mecca had prominence in the Arab world, Medina had prominence in the Arab world, and now there's this newly conquered ter newly conquered territory of uh, you know the city of Jerusalem, and they're kind of like, hey, what about us? And so by building a mosque and giving it the name, the furthest mosque, Al-Aqsa, they can say, look, we're important too. We matter. We're significant. And uh, I kind of equate it to the fact, I, I, having grown up in Toronto, it reminds me of when Toronto in the 70s, 80s, when Toronto was trying to assert itself as a world city and was addicted to world, the word world class because Toronto, for most of its history, was a little out of the way provincial city, not very important. Uh, the, the big city in Canada up until 1976, 1977 was Montreal. That was the corporate center of Canada. That's where all the banks had all, all their head offices. Montreal was the most important city. But then when the Quebecers elected the Parti Québécois, the separatists, and brought them into power, then corporate Canada moved its head offices from Montreal, and they went down the 401, and they set up shop in Toronto. So now all of a sudden Toronto became the corporate center of Canada. And Toronto was like, I always equated it to being Toronto, being like the look at me, like the youngest kid in a family trying to get attention. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And that's the way I look upon Jerusalem when the Muslims conquered it. They, you know, they, they've got a city now, but Mecca's hugely important. Medina's hugely important. And the people in the, the Arabs who have um, colonized the Judea and Jerusalem, they're like, well, we're important too. And so they built a mosque and said, well, what are we going to call it? Let's call it the furthest mosque, the Al-Aqsa mosque, and then we'll be important too. And that's one explanation I've heard, and it certainly seems plausible to me. Um, Mudbrook Farmer's talking about CIA involvement, yes. World leaders tried to shape our future. Johnny Appleseed says exit. Uh, Mud, Rock Farmer, Mud Duck Farmer says, well, we here. Uh, world blows up and, and you know, we're getting into a lot. A lot of this centers on end times prophecy because the Temple Mount is hugely significant, I think, for all three faiths, for Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And uh, so in terms of why it's so significant, now the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, these are two separate buildings. And it's actually held, believed by most, that the, Solomon's actual temple was over top of the Dome of the Rock. And there are some who hold that the Ark of the Covenant, if you've seen... Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, and the Covenant. They, they claim that the Ark of the Covenant also sat on that rock, that same rock that uh, Isaac was bound to and was being offered up as a sacrifice by his father Abraham. There's contention. They say, you see these marks, that's where the, that's where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And the Ark of the Covenant is the gold-crested box with the two uh, cherubim winged creatures over top with the all, all laden with gold where the um, the ten commandments were i believe it also contains the manna from heaven that the israelites ate while they were wandering in the desert as well as i think maybe uh, moses's staff that he carried and these are the items that are, are said to have been inside. And some people still think we may find, they think there are individuals who think that the, um, that the Ark of the Covenant still exists. Some think it's down in Ethiopia. 
Uh, some think it's buried somewhere behind the Western Wall, uh, the Wailing Wall, which is a retaining wall part of the Temple Mount. Going to catch up. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer says, no one is stopping this, so look at worst outcome. Johnny Appleseed says, they blew it. Montreal, I mean. Uh, I love Montreal. I hate the traffic. Absolutely detest the traffic. But once I get downtown into the old city of Montreal, I, I, I always go to, I haven't been for years, but I would always go to a place called Eau de Pierrot and be the only Anglophone in there and just drinking up the French culture. Uh, Johnny Apple said, Appleseed says, humans love to embellish. Oh, yes, we do. So the significant the significant significance comes now in the present day. There are the there are this this Dome of the Rock and the Al Aqsa Mosque, but Jews believe that by building a third temple, that it will usher in the Messianic age, because Jews, it must be remembered, uh, do not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They are still waiting for the Messiah. Uh, but they do not believe the Messianic age, the age of the Messiah, can start until the temple is rebuilt. Christians, not all, but many Christians, certainly those who identify as dispensationalists, believe that the second coming of, of Jesus, before Jesus is coming, we first have to have the Antichrist, and we can't have the Antichrist until the temple is built. So uh, Christians, uh, dispensationalist Christians, who are looking uh, toward the second coming of Jesus Christ, believe that before that can happen, that the Jews must rebuild a third temple on the Temple Mount. But the problem is, the temple is already the temple mount is occupied. There is the Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, and so how are you going to put a Jewish temple there? Um, Mud Duck Farmer says, "Nuke stone? Then what? This is all crazy." I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you. I understand the worldview. Uh, and that's actually what I can see happening, and I've, uh, and I've speculated here on it before, that uh, it strikes me that Israel is almost to a degree trying to provoke certainly Iran. Uh, it was last week that uh, Iran uh, had their embassy in Damascus, Syria, it was hit by Israeli F-35 fighter aircraft. Missiles were shot, not at the embassy itself, but on an annex, a consular annex attached to the embassy. And so they knocked out that annex. They killed 11 people, two Iranian generals, a number of other Iranian military officials, as well as some Syrian nationals. And Iran has threatened, but has thus far, unless something's happened in the last few minutes while I've been talking in the last hour or so, there, the, the retaliation hasn't come yet, but Iran is promising that they're going to retaliate and they're going to strike back at Israel. And in what form that would take, we don't know. Iran could do in a fashion, they could do what Israel did. Rather than attacking Israeli territory itself, they could attack an Israeli embassy in Europe, in North America, in another part of the world, in a kind of a tit for tat relation, relationship. I, I, but my speculation is that perhaps Israel is hoping to provoke an attack so that if missiles start flying, and one and a stray missile just quote unquote accidentally hits the Temple Mount and takes out the Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rocks. Well, then you've got open real estate. You've got think of 
there are individuals who say that the re one one of the reasons why the, the the twin towers were taken down was because they were old buildings that they wanted demolished anyway, and they wanted to you know build something modern. Lots of different rabbit holes you can go down. Uh, Vivian Hutt says, great evening, Gordon. From my perspective, they've been fighting over the same God, but from different perspectives. When side by side, they aren't all that far apart in spirit. The one thing is between the Islamic world and the, Ju the Judaic world is they both hold to this doctrine of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life. There is no doctrine in Judaism or Islam about turning the other cheek. And uh, uh, how much they are alike or not, I have my opinions on that. Consider them perhaps somewhat dangerous to express. Uh, but when you look at the manner in which uh, the Islamic faith was born through Muhammad and he was living in, in Arabia where there were Christian communities, where there were Jewish communities. And so the, there were Jewish and Christian influences on Muhammad. And one of the things is Jews pray three times a day, bowing toward or, or, or you know, bowing their heads down toward Jerusalem, three times a day. Well, Muhammad comes along and says, well, we bow five times a day, five times. And Jews, when they pray, they either rock or they bow their head. Muhammad says, no, if you're Muslim, you, you get down right on your knees and you, you put your head to the ground. We go even lower. We go even further. We're more devout. We, we, we're, we're more worthy. Uh, I'm trying to remember what day it is when a Jewish child is um, circumcised, uh, the, what they call the bris. Uh, and I think it's day eight, and I might be mistaken. I'm not Jewish. But I think it's the eighth day after a male child is born that they are circumcised. Muslims often, uh, Ishmael was circumcised at the age of 13. And so it is the practice in some Muslim, it's not universal, but there are elements within Islam where the boys are circumcised at the age of 13. And so it's like, oh, you think your circumcision was something? You did it when you were eight days old. You don't even remember. It happened to me at 13. I promise you any boy who got circumcised at 13 would absolutely remember it. I was born 1966 in Canada at a time where it was standard operating procedure. Every male child in the hospital was circumcised automatically. And it was, you know, no question. It was considered to be more hygienic. So it was more for public health. And now things have flipped around and now, uh, some say it's barbaric and that it's mutilating and yada, yada, yada. Uh, um, I don't want to get into circumcision. Uh, let's just see what everyone is talking about. Um, Mud Duck Farmer says, agreed, all the gods playing games in heaven and they're all friends. Uh, in, my, in my book, there's only one god. I'm a monotheist. There is one creator of heaven and earth. It's not a pantheon. Uh, Johnny Appleseed is talking about a temporal power, power struggle, absolutely. Uh, my life verse, I've mentioned it many times on here. It comes from um, Luke 14, I think it's Luke 14, verse 11. And God help me, I can't, my memory is slipping, but the verse is, uh, all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. And it's the backstory to my life verses that Jesus is, uh, tells a parable uh, and gives advice based on the way he sees people seating 
the way they picked the seats at, at a gathering, noting how some had sought out the seats of honor, the highest seats. And he said, when you go to a wedding feast, do not seek out the highest seat. Do not seek out the seat of honor, but rather go to the lowest seat. Because if you take the highest seat, someone more important than you may show up, and then the host will come up and he'll say to you, go lower. This man is more prominent than you. And you will begin with shame. But rather, instead of that, go take that lowest seat. And then perhaps the, the host of the wedding feast will come to you and say, my friend, why are you seated so low? Here, come up higher. And then you will be exalted by everyone who's sitting at table. And then he said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And when I look at the Islamic practice of, well, we bow you know, five times a day, you only do it three, and we, we go right down to the ground, forehead right down to the ground, we're better than you. you know, and I see this as, uh, you know, we're... And Christ taught humility. That we're not to think that we're all that in a bag of chips. We, we're not. We're, we're, you know, and, and I'm very distressed over any form of racism where people try and elevate themselves over another group and, oh, the Jews are horrible. Yeah, guess what? Yeah, Jews can be very bad people. And so can Americans and Canadians and Europeans and African Americans and Native Americans and every group. We are all broken, fault humanity. There is not one good group among us. It's just a matter of capacity. You give anyone power over another group and it gets abused every single time. There is no virtuous group of people in my books. Um, Johnny Appleseed. How is it that Islam happened hundreds of years after? Um, you know, Islam is the, the, of the three Abrahamic faiths, it is the youngest. When we go back to, if you, if you say that Abraham was the father of Judaism, then that, that makes uh, Judaism a 4,000 year old faith. Christianity, Christianity is a um, two thousand year old faith, give or take, and then Islam came along in the five hundreds. In the in the I always forget <laughs> in the five hundreds A.D. and it said that Muhammad died in six thirty two, so the end of the five hundreds, early six hundreds. That's when Muhammad lived. And so it's a young, it's a much younger religion, but um, the Arabian Peninsula had, uh, it's a well-established, I don't think it's in any dispute, Muhammad was a warlord. And the Arabians had always been fighting in tri tribal warfare over water rights and things of that nature. And they've been fighting with each other and Muhammad rose up and my genuine opinion, he borrowed a little bit of Christianity, he borrowed a bit of, of uh, Judaism and he did what Joseph Smith did in the 1800s in the United States with the creation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He created his own faith. That's my view, dangerous though it might be. That's my genuine opinion. Mud Duck Farmer, it gave, it gave paperwork to God what I got now. Stand straight. Uh, Mud Duck Farmer. You know, there's a lot of defending faith in today's world is difficult because we've been indoctrinated to view the world in a, in a materialistic, in a... In, in based on facts, based on empirical da data. And that, in terms of this life, it will only get you so far. These, it's difficult for me to put faith into words. God help me, but um, 
it's difficult to put it into words, but there is more to this life than the material. Uh, every Everything that is material ends up, it comes to dust, and that includes ourselves. But uh, I just know within my core that there is something eternal in me and you and everyone. It's not a, you know, the, the, uh, I'm not just, Life is not meaningless. And if there is no God, if everything is just uh, the result of random accidents, then life is meaningless. Then we're just one random accident from not having been in existence. Humanity is just the result of ac a, a series of random accidents. Well, then do whatever you want. There's no point. There's no righteousness. There's no virtue. There's no morality in anything. We're just going to catch up. <laughs> Johnny Appleseed is talking about circumcision and uh, male, referring to it as male sexual torture. Why? And that famous joke, you know, why isn't Justin Trudeau circ circumcised? Because there's no end to that. Um, Vibhan Hot says, if the jar of dirt helps, I don't know what the jar of dirt he's referring to means. Johnny Appleseed, warlord, yes, Muhammad. That's a well. And I don't think that's a, something that's a, in dispute even among Muslims, that that uh, Muhammad was a, you know, a tribal leader and, and that he engaged in warfare with neighboring tribes and he built a following. You know, uh, and then after his death, you know, the, the his followers then created, you know, a religion was built around it, Islam. And they conquered a large part of the world from maybe, I think, Afghanistan to the east, all the way out to the Iberian Peninsula. The Arabic language influenced the uh, Spanish language. It's why El Dorado and El, El this, El that, it's uh, Al in, in Arabic, it became El in, in Spanish. Languages are not static things. And, uh, you know, they had, they, they colonized much of the, they colonized the Middle East, they colonized North Africa, the Iberian Peninsula, all the way out to Afghanistan. They're huge colonizers. I find it ironic people when they talk about Israel quite often they say well they're colonialists well yeah so were the Arabs you know the 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 the, the people of the Arabian Peninsula are not native Arabians are not native to the Levant to Palestine they're native to the Arabian Peninsula they colonized and Abraham came from Mesopotamia so he's ethnically Mesopotamian, and he came into the land of the Canaanites. The indigenous original population in Canaan were the Canaanites. It was not the descendants of Abraham, nor the descendants of from, from the Arabian Peninsula. Just going to catch up. Uh, Johnny Appleseed says, completely agree to faith borrowed. You know, it's just part of our not. It's part of our hum, our fallen human nature. To you know, my life verse being you know, humble, humble yourself, don't exalt yourself. I think it's human nature for us to exalt ourselves, to want to be better, to want to have that 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 first seat, and that existed in Jesus's time. Jesus said, you know, he, he made note of the fact that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, the, the rabbis, you know, how they liked the seats of honor and how they, you know, loved their fancy robes and they splayed out their tassels wider than anyone else because, you know, look at me, I'm so big and I'm so good. You know, uh, Jesus made the point that two men went into the temple one was a Pharisee and the other one was a, a tax collector or something. 
And the Pharisee went in and exalted himself before God and said, thank God, goodness, I'm not like this horrible, sinful man. Uh, you know, I'm righteous and good and all the, you know, I'm all that in a bag of chips, God. And whereas the other man beat himself about the breast and he said, you know, pity, take pity on me, Lord, I'm a horrible man, I'm a sinner. I, and, and then Jesus asked the question, who left the synagogue more justified? I say unto you, it was the man who was beating his chest left justified, not the man who boasted about how great he was. Uh, I find it curious that Christianity, I think, is the middle, is the proper path. I don't think Judaism is the right path. I don't think Islam is the right path. Jesus said false prophets will come. Well, 500 or so years after Jesus went to the cross, a man came along claiming to be a prophet to the people on the Arabian Peninsula. And dangerous to say it, but I'm going to say it again. False prophet, same as Joseph Smith in uh, the United States in the 1830s, 40s, whenever it was, with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, better known as the Mormons, another false prophet. Uh, I'm just going to finish off with what everyone's saying because I've gone on for way too long, an hour and 15 now. The Moors conquered Spain. Uh, now corporations own everything. Uh, I think mud duck farmer meant to say everything and pretty much. Uh, and that we're left to buy stock in their companies. and We can buy stock, which is just notional value. The old greater fool theory. Stock is worthless, but if you can find a fool greater than you to pay more than what you paid, you win the game. Uh, and Monarchy is reminded of calling Trudeau an insufferable, unfortunate word, T-W-A-T. Recently in the comments, and I think YouTube might have censored the comment as it seemed to have disappeared a bit later. It wasn't me. I would have no problem with that. I won't say that myself. It's the same with those tr signs with the F. Trudeau, I agree with the sentiment, but I'm not going to say it. I actually think it. Uh, helps him. I think those flags help Trudeau. Uh, uh, Weeben Hutt remembers when Anna Monarchy called Trudeau an insufferable. Wah, wah. Anna Monarchy, I spelled it and used symbols to try and get around it. Uh, and Vibhan Hadas also, it appears, played the stock market because he says, I knew it. I am that fool. We've all been. If you've played the stock market, I have as well. We've all been that fool. If you've been able to pass on those shares that you bought foolishly at a high price to someone else for an even higher price, then you won the game. And I've won and lost at it. It's uh, The stock market is, uh, is a shark tank. And... Uh, it's rigged <laughs> and even knowing it's rigged doesn't make it any easier to play anyway i've gone on long enough thank you very much for watching i hope you, i hope at least uh, some may have come come away having learned something from this i'm finding my uh people will know that i've been unapologetically supportive of israel in their conflict with hamas hezbollah the houthis Something happened recently, which I found disquieting. Uh, I am not a fan of U2 or Bono. No use for Bono or U2. I never liked their music to begin with. I thought it was hyped up. I, I, I've long suspected, yeah, they, you know, they sold out and got promoted and, you know, sold as the great, you know, the greatest rock band of their particular generation. I never thought their music was all that special. And I saw that Bono recently has spoken out in favor of Israel. And I don't like that. I don't like being on the same side as Bono on anything. And, you know, uh, 
I, I know absolutely that Israel under Netanyahu or under anyone else is broken and fallen. And, you know, they're, they're not perfect, but nor, nor is anyone the, in the Islamic world. And so this makes this a very difficult situation to navigate. Even hot talking about the market says no one gives good retirement packages anymore. Where else are you going to go? I think about the best thing you do, and this isn't advice, but I'll say it, is um, MUT funds or ETFs, exchange traded funds. Uh, I think playing the individual market, buying and selling stocks, uh, you, you, you'll hit, you know, if you know how the game is played, you'll hit some winners, but you're still going to lose. And uh, ego gets involved. And people, you know, and I've been guilty of this. You don't know when to take a loss. You think, you know, and and if you play the market long enough, you you know, it'll happen where you'll decide, hey, I'm going to cut my losses, and then within a week, the stock jumps above where where it was when you originally bought it. And sometimes you buy back in thinking, oh, I knew it all along, and oh, it's a horrible game, and it plays on your emotions, and they know it. Uh, I'm just trying to get to the end. Uh, Aminarchy is getting late here in the Eastern time zone. Good night or whenever it is where you are, everyone. My duck, uh, I did. I go steal rock and war. Even hot ditto uh, on no bono. No, I can't stand bono. Uh, uh, and a solid portfolio. Yeah. Best thing I think for those, especially if you're not too familiar with the stock market, is MUT funds, mutual funds, ETFs, exchange traded funds. There are all kinds of options out there. Uh, Johnny Appleseed buried in the backyard. Yeah, sure. If it's gold, silver, or something tangible, even hot long term. Bitcoin, I don't know enough about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm forever being told how to become a Bitcoin trader, but I don't know enough about cryptocurrencies. I know a bit, but not enough to risk. Anyway, God bless. Thank you for watching. As always, thank you for the seven thumbs up. And uh, I know it's rambly and all over the place, but I really enjoy this. Vivian Hutt and I have both played the day trader game. I wouldn't call myself day trader, but it was pretty darn close to that because I would flip quick. I even played options, puts, and calls. But I'm going off topic. YouTube, be well, Johnny Appleseed, Vivian Hutt, um, Mud Duck Farmer, and Monarchy, everyone who chimed in. If I missed anyone, I apologize. Thank you for this. And if you like this and you want to, if you've got nothing better to do on a Wednesday, late Wednesday, Sunday nights, late in the Eastern time zone, jump on and uh, we'll see what we talk about then. Uh, hope, boring is good, uh, but uh, there's part of me that almost hopes that something significant would happen in the world so I'd have something new to talk about. But until then, we'll talk to you later. Hopefully I'll have a joke or two between now and Sunday. God bless.